Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 14th chapter titled The Circle Widens. Whenever the devotees of Hari assemble together, they do not like to gossip, but prefer to do Hari Kirtan and nothing else. Whoever comes within the circumference of that spiritual gathering will certainly feel an irresistible desire to participate in that spiritual dance. The sweet spiritual environment created by the kirtan is called Haripari Mandala in the scriptures. Whenever Haripari Mandala is created, be it for five minutes, three hours, or 24 hours, Due to the intense collective devotion, the environment becomes so sweet and blissful that it becomes highly congenial for spiritual ideation, dhyan. At that time, Hari moves his nucleus there and becomes the focal point of dhyan, the object of ideation. One day, in late July, Ram Kilavan a well-to-do Jamalpur businessman was lying on a cot in front of his house in the Olipur neighborhood, reading the Bhagavad Gita. How nice it would be, he thought, if I can spend my whole life like this, repeating the name of the Lord and reading books about God. The chapter he was reading, however, bothered him. He didn't like it when Krishna equated himself with the greatest of everything such as the Ganges among rivers. If God is in everything, then why does he have to praise himself by comparing himself to the greatest and most important things on this earth and thus try to set himself apart? At that moment, a passerby wearing a white dhoti and kurta stopped and asked him what he was reading. When Ram Kilavan told him, the stranger sat down without introducing himself and asked if he could have a look. Ah, yes, chapter 10, the man said, fingering the pages. How do you like this chapter? I love the book, but I have a problem with this chapter. I don't see why Krishna should have to praise himself like this. I am the Ganges of the rivers. I am the Meru of the mountains. I am the sacred Banyan of all the trees. He seems to be beating his own drum. No, no, you shouldn't think like this the man replied calmly. Though God is present in everything, the Gita expresses it in this way so as to arouse devotion, to show that in everything, the Lord is the highest expression. That's all it is doing. Well, I must be on my way. Enjoy your reading. The man saluted Ram Kilaban and continued down the road toward Rampur colony. When Ram Kilaban returned to his reading, he discovered that his feeling toward that passage had changed. Well, maybe Krishna is right after all, he thought. A few days later, his close friend, Dasarat Singh, a bifocal 44-year-old soft-spoken headmaster of a nearby school, came to his house, brimming over with excitement. Ram Kilaban, he said, clasping his friend's hands. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about finding a spiritual master? You told me that I shouldn't settle for any ordinary guru, that I should only accept the best, a perfect master. Well, I found him, and I didn't even have to leave Jamalpur. Can you imagine? Ram Kilavan's heart began to beat faster. Is it really true? You found a perfect master in Jamalpur itself? Yes. I am so fortunate. I can't tell you how grateful I feel. The gods have smiled on me, my friend. If that's so, then you must take me straight away to meet him. You know how long I've been waiting to find a spiritual master. Dasarath hesitated. It's not that easy. He doesn't allow us to disclose his name or his address without prior permission. First we have to give him the name of anyone who's interested. Then he closes his eyes and reviews their samskaras, both this life and the past ones. Then he decides 
if the person is fit for initiation or not. His disciples say that he only accepts persons who were already practicing sadhana in their previous lifetimes. Well, if that is the case, then please put my petition before your master at the first possible opportunity. I will wait. Ram Kilavan was so impressed with the sense of gratitude and good fortune expressed by his friend, whom he knew to be the soberest and most unassuming of men, that as he lay on his bed that night, he mentally addressed Dasarath's new master. I don't know if you will consider me fit or not, whether you will give me permission or not, but I want to tell you that from this moment onward, I accept you as my master. Even if you do not give me permission to take initiation, I will continue to consider you my master and no other. A couple of days later, Dasarath was sitting in the ashram with Baba and some fellow disciples. Baba turned to him and said, A person close to you has made a direct approach to me. Tell him that he should go through proper channels as per system. Dasarath was surprised. Who was it, he asked. You name the persons close to you, and I will tell you which one it was. One by one, Dasarath named his relatives and close friends. After each one, Baba shook his head no. Running out of names, he finally mentioned Ram Kilavan, though he was sure that it could not be him. To his surprise, Baba said, Yes, that is his name. He should go through proper channels. Anyhow, you may tell him that he has permission to contact an Acharya and take initiation. The next evening, Dasarath went to Ram Kilavan's house, feeling miffed at his friend. Ram Kilavan, I told you I would put your petition before the master. Why did you make a direct approach to Baba without waiting? What are you talking about? I made no such contact with your Baba. How could I? You didn't even tell me his name or where he lives. What exactly did he say? When Dasarath recounted his conversation with Baba, Ram Kilovan remembered his fervent prayer from two days earlier and told his friend what had happened. Now, explain to me the proper system. When Ram Kilovan met Baba for the first time, some days later, he recognized him as the man who had stopped and changed his mind about the Gita. His wife and four young daughters would take initiation shortly afterward, and all of them would soon be counted amongst the most ardent of Baba's followers. Gradually, the circle widened. More and more newcomers were drawn by the devotional fervor that was rapidly blossoming among the disciples. In March 1956, Chandranath brought his 19-year-old cousin, Harinder, whom he had initiated a few weeks before, to his first darshan. Harinder described his reaction when he saw Baba for the first time, a reaction typical of many new disciples during those first years of Ananda Marga. I was sent into Baba's room by Shiva Shankar Da and immediately did Sastang Pranam. My first thought when I got up was that he had sent me into the wrong room because the person I saw in front of me was wearing very ordinary dress, dhoti, kurta, and spectacles, an ordinary gentleman, whereas I had been expecting a holy man with orange robes and flowing hair. After I came out, Pranayda told me to take a seat in the hall with the others. Bindeshwari was singing a song about Baba. He was laughing one moment and crying the next. I thought he must be a serious mental patient and had come to Baba to get cured. Pranayda asked some of the others to remove him from the hall. As they were taking him out, he cried. You can throw me out of the hall, but you can't throw me out of Baba's heart. Then another person started singing a Bengali song. I don't know anything, Baba, and you are the knower of all. There is nothing to say about me. Your glory is on everyone's lips. Then this person also became abnormal, and they also carried him out. Baba came out and took his seat on a cot. There were no decorations, just an incense stick burning and a single tube light for illumination. As soon as Baba came out, many people started acting abnormal, weeping, laughing, falling on the floor, dancing. I was convinced that my cousin had brought me to a place full of madmen. 
a kind of lunatic asylum. Then Baba gave a long discourse. I didn't pay much attention. I was watching the people. But I remember he talked about surrender. After the talk was over and Baba had left, we went out to the compound of the school. But I told the new people that the DMC was over, that we should each go into Baba's room and do pranam, and then we were free to go. I went and stood in line. When my turn came, I prostrated before Baba and immediately lost consciousness. I don't know for how long. The next thing I remembered was hearing Baba's voice telling me, Harinder, get up. When I got up, I found that I was wrapped in a black blanket. I was crying. When I tried to understand why I was crying, the tears started flowing, even more profusely. I thought that I had become one of the madmen. But Anaida said, Listen, you have to see that others also get time, so don't take the time of others. I went out and sat in the compound, but I felt an irresistible attraction pulling me toward Baba, a tremendous urge to go and sit near him. My entire body was very, very light. I felt very healthy and energetic. Since my childhood, I have never had such a feeling. After that, a couple of other devotees accompanied me to the railway station. When I got there, I could feel my mind pulling me back again to Baba. It was almost impossible to resist. At that moment, I realized that the love I had been missing since the death of my parents had returned to me many fold. I had finally found the one I had been searching for so many years. The person who sang the Bengali song was Gopin, an official in the Central Excise Department posted under Nagina. He would often go into Samadhi when he sang devotional songs for Baba at the beginning of the DMC or Darshan program. At times, other devotees would also become affected when they tried to bring him back to normal consciousness. The mere touch of his body somehow communicated his intoxicated state. In fact, Gopen would usually become abnormal whenever he saw Baba, sometimes dancing on one leg, at other times weeping and calling out Baba's name as he entered into various states of ecstatic trance. Several devotees recall entering Baba's room and finding Gopen lying there in a state of samadhi. One time in Ranchi, Gopen went into samadhi just as he was about to initiate someone. As might be expected, the prospective initiate immediately ran away. On another occasion, after Baba had left the DMC dais, Gopen became so absorbed in his ideation that he sat down on the empty dais, opened his hands into Varavaya Mudra, and began repeating over and over, I am Ananda Murti, I am Ananda Murti. It was soon rumored that Baba had given Gopen the power to see the past, present, and future. One Sunday, while waiting for Baba to arrive at the ashram, Nityananda decided to test him. I have some urgent work with Baba, he told him. Do you know if he is already on his way to the ashram, or if he is still at his house? Gopen raised his eyebrows, clearly annoyed by the question, and looked away. But Nityananda continued to insist. Finally, Gopen smiled and closed his eyes. Baba is on his way now to the ashram, he said, his eyes still closed. At this moment, he is walking down the market lane on his way to a Rampur colony. Nityananda jumped and hurried out the door to his bicycle. He pedaled as fast as he could toward the market lane, knowing just where he would intercept Baba, if what Gopen had said were true. Sure enough, Baba was exactly where Gopen had indicated he would be. The enigmatic Gopen, along with Bindeshwari and others like them, were an integral part of the intense devotional climate that surrounded Baba. An environment so unusual to the initiated that it made Harinder wonder if his cousin had brought him to a lunatic asylum. Baba's evening field walk was another opportunity for the disciples to enjoy the Master's company and bask in the glow of his multifaceted personality. No topic was outside Baba's range of interest. On any given night, the discussion could segue from politics to astronomy to natural history to anthropology to art 
all enriched with a never-ending series of illustrative stories and quotations from poets, writers, and philosophers, sometimes in languages they had never heard before, which he would then translate. Once Ram Tanuk and several other disciples were accompanying Baba on fuel walk near Ranchi. After a long explanation of how the caste system had developed during the Buddhist era, Baba launched into a discussion of the difference in psychology between the people of Magadha in southern Bihar and those of Mithila in northern Bihar, pointing out how the domestic cows of those areas also shared some of these same psychological differences. He stopped and asked him why there was so much dust there. Everyone remained quiet. You will find that southern Bihar is very dusty, while Patna is not, Baba said. The weather in Patna is sultrier, and the soil becomes quite sticky during the rainy season, whereas in southern Bihar, it becomes very dusty once the rain stops. Can anyone tell me why that is? Baba paused, but no one ventured an answer. It is because the soil here is newly formed by comparison, whereas the soil of Patna is quite old and therefore has more elasticity. Newly formed soil turns to dust very easily. If you walk in Patna after a rainfall, it becomes difficult to take a second step because the soil clumps to your feet. Sometimes Baba would turn the spotlight on the disciples' personal history, recalling incidents from their past that they themselves had forgotten, as if he had been there to witness them. Harinder recalled a few such incidents from his early field walks that were typical of the intimate and informal nature of Baba's relationship with his disciples at this time. Once I was sitting with Baba on the tiger's grave when he asked me what my father's last words were when he was on his deathbed. That was in 1947. I told Baba I couldn't remember, but he asked me repeatedly to keep trying. I tried as hard as I could, but all I could remember about the scene was that there was tears in his eyes. Three of my uncles were present there, and also one elderly man of the village, a servant, two sister-in-laws, and myself. That much I remembered, but not what he said. Then Baba touched me on the back of my spine. Immediately, the scene flashed in my mind, and I remembered. As I spoke the words, Baba also spoke them along with me. Harinder, I am sorry I cannot do anything for you. You should maintain good relations with all. You should work hard and remain in the company of good people. Baba and I repeated the same words together at the same time. Another time, when I was sitting with him on the grave, he started telling me that there used to be two women in my village who were both called Radia. They were mother and daughter, and both were widows. They were also great devotees of God and sincere spiritual aspirants. He said that they used to take bath regularly in the rivulet in front of my house. I told Baba that the water was unfit for bathing because drainage water is funneled into it. But Baba had told me that it had been a flowing river at that time, and even boats used to ply it. He said that there had been a gat in front of my house, where they used to take bath. Then I remembered that when they were digging a well in that area, the people had found some broken remnants of a boat. The next time I went to my village, I inquired about the two women, but nobody seemed to know anything about them. There was one very old man there, who was well over a hundred. He had been a good hunter in his younger days and was very sturdy. I went to visit him and started to talk about this and that. In the end, I asked him whether at any time there had been two women in the village named Radia and Radia, mother and daughter. He remembered right away that when he was very young, he had seen them regularly taking bath in the river in front of my house. After that, they would spend hours worshipping God. They were both widows and did not have any descendants. He asked me how I had learned about them. I said that I had heard about them from a saint. Another day at the tiger's grave, Baba was talking to me about the need for keeping good company. 
He reminded me of an incident from when I had been student of class 8. One day, the public relations department from Musafarpur showed a documentary film in our village high school. I went to see the documentary, but I arrived very late. It was already over. While I was returning home, a big storm arose, which is common in summer. On the way, one boy told me about a particular mango grove, where lots of mangoes were sure to have fallen to the ground in the storm. He said they were very sweet, and he tried to convince me to go there with him. Actually, he had something against the owner of that grove. When we got there, we found that a few mangoes had fallen, but the boy climbed the tree and started vigorously shaking the branches. A lot of mangoes fell to the ground. I knew that if the owner came to know about it, he would complain to my family that I was stealing mangoes from his grove in the dark. I could well imagine the consequences. I was very frightened and ran home. I spent the whole night shaking with fear. I was also angry with that boy for taking me there under false pretenses. This incident disturbed me for many days. Baba reminded me about the incident and he told the name of the owner of the grove, Rudar Singh, and the name of the boy who took me there, Ragunandan Paswan. It felt strange to hear Baba recount the whole incident in such detail, including their names, since I had completely forgotten about it. I told Baba that the boy had deceived me and that I had run away when I realized that he was trying to use me. Yes, Baba said. That is why I say that it is essential to always keep good company. There were two things that all the disciples who accompanied him on these walks agreed upon. Baba was a superb storyteller, and he was extremely humorous. One day, Baba was sitting on the grave talking about the relationship between adult children and their elderly parents. He told the story to illustrate his point. As always, he accompanied his story with the gestures and shifts in tone of voice of an accomplished actor, eliciting loud laughter from the disciples in the process. Once there was an old man who lived with his son and his daughter-in-law. One day, a friend of his dropped by for a visit and asked him how he was doing. Don't ask, the old man said. I don't even get proper food these days. His friend thought about it for a moment. Then he handed him a silver coin. Here, take this coin. Each night when your son and his wife go to bed, take the coin and drop it against the bedstead 200 times. Why, what good would that do? Just trust me, the friend told him. I'll come back after a week or so and see how it's going. The old man did exactly as his friend asked. Each night, his son and daughter-in-law heard the sound of the coin clinking against the bedstead. They became convinced that the old man had a secret stash of money that he was counting each night. One day, while the old man was out, they searched his room. They didn't find anything, but that only convinced them that he was hiding it really well. They didn't want to take a chance of losing the money when he died, so they started treating him better. When his friend came back, the old man said, My friend, this coin has changed my life. When the old man finally died, his son and daughter-in-law searched his room, but all they found was a single silver coin lying near his pillow. Only then did they realize that the old man had been cleverer than they had given him credit for. Though Baba was rarely quiet on field walk, there was one week in 1956 when he made an exception. On Sunday, he made an announcement. During the coming week, I am going to maintain a strict watch on all my disciples to see how sincerely they are following the principles of Yama Niyama, and at the end of the week I will hand out punishment for any deviations, though I won't disclose the actual faults in public. All conversation at the tiger's grave is forbidden during this time. No one should ask any questions. I will be watching my disciples wherever they might be, and I don't want to be disturbed. Naturally, the disciples were determined to be on their best behavior. One evening, a few days later, Nityananda was standing in the courtyard of the ashram with Goba and Dwarikanath, 
when his desire got the better of him. Dwarikanath, give me the snuff box. What? You promised you wouldn't take snuff this week. You know Baba is watching. Just hand it over, Dwarikanath. It's been long enough. Dwarikanath reluctantly handed him the snuff box. Just as Nityananda was about to take a pinch, Dwarikanath started scolding him. His tone of voice and mannerisms suddenly identical to Baba's. What do you think you are doing, Nityananda? Do you think you can hide your actions from me? I told you I would be watching. If required, I appear in physical form also. Nobody can perform any secret action without my knowledge. Do you understand? Goba's eyes went wide in surprise. Dwarikanath has become Baba, he exclaimed. He ran into the ashram, shouting over and over again, Dwarikanath has become Baba. Dwarikanath has become Baba. Come and see. Then he ran back to where Nityananda and Dwarikanath were standing and did Sastang Pranam in front of Dwarikanath. Several Margis were trailing behind him, eager to see what was happening. In the meantime, Nityananda became frightened. He hurriedly put the snuff box back in Dwarikanath's pocket while Dwarikanath stood there with his hands on his hips and a stern expression on his face, continuing to chide him for failing to observe proper discipline. After a few minutes, Dwarikanath reverted back to his normal self. What happened to you, Nityananda asked. Why were you acting like that? I don't know, Dwarikanath replied, with a confused look on his face. I don't know what happened. It was like I wasn't there at all. The curious Margi spent the next few minutes discussing amongst themselves, finally coming to the conclusion that Baba had somehow borrowed Dwarikanath's body for those few minutes in order to reprimand Nityananda. Nityananda, however, had his doubts. Perhaps because we were talking about Baba, he mused. The thought of Baba came into his subconscious mind, and that influenced his conscious mind. When everyone else had left, he invited Dwarikanath to accompany him to his quarters with the intention of testing him when no one else was around. When they arrived, Nityananda asked once again for the snuff box. As soon as Dwarikanath handed it over, his voice and mannerisms changed. Nityananda, he said, are you trying to test me? Don't you know that I am always with you, watching your every action, every moment of the day? If necessary, I will even appear physically in front of you. You cannot hide anything from me neither your actions nor your thoughts. Startled, Nityananda threw the snuff box out the window. Moments later, Dwarikanath reverted to his normal self. When Nityananda questioned him, he was unaware of what had happened. It was as if those few minutes had not registered at all on his consciousness. On Sunday, the Margis assembled in the ashram for Baba's darshan. A blackboard was brought and Baba started to write down the names of various disciples. Beside each name, he wrote out their respective punishments. After writing Nityananda's name and his punishment, he drew a line through it. Then he turned to the disciples and said, Nityananda was about to commit a mistake. In fact, he had already committed that mistake mentally. But since he didn't actually do it, the punishment is hereby struck off. When one Margi asked for clarification, Baba said, he was about to take snuff, a punishable offense, when an unseen force prevented him from committing that mistake. Because of that warning from this unseen force, he was able to restrain himself. For that reason, I have forgiven him. Ram Naresh Pandey, an officer in the VMP, was posted in Jamalpur from 1955 to 1957. During that time, he availed of every possible opportunity to accompany the master on evening walk. Ram Naresh was an excellent singer. Whenever he was present at the tiger's grave, Baba would request him to sing a devotional song or two, generally in Bhojpuri, Ram Naresh's mother tongue, and Baba's favorite childhood language. One night, Ram Naresh was delayed by his official duties. By the time he reached the field, it was nearly 10 o'clock. He went straight to the tiger's grave, hoping fervently that Baba might still be there. Finding the grave deserted, he started searching the other places where the master would occasionally stop, but to no avail. Unhappy that he had missed out on Baba's darshan for the night, he went back to the grave and sat down. 
while he was sitting there. Storm clouds gathered with the startling rapidity so common in the rainy season in northern India. It quickly became so dark that he couldn't see more than a few feet in front of him. Then the heavens opened, and a sudden heavy downpour left him shivering and drenched to the bone. Refusing to accept his defeat, he got up and started walking back toward the ashram, singing a Bojpuri song, with his arms upraised and his eyes half closed, buoyed by the conviction that he could call Baba to him with his song. O oh, Baba, he sang, I have developed such an intense love for you. It is the love of eons. He sang the same lines over and over again, with his eyes half closed. As he made the long, soggy journey through the fields, through the outskirts of town, when he reached the wooden footbridge that crossed the railroad tracks to the east of the station, he felt someone reach out and catch his arm. Turning, he saw Chandranath looming out of the darkness. Ram Naresh, Chandranath said, you have done something wondrous, but why didn't you come to the ashram with the weather so bad? Baba was giving us some important dictation there. Suddenly he stopped and told us that we needed to go to the grave. Ram Naresh is waiting for me there, he said, crying and getting totally wet. Where is Baba now, Ram Naresh asked, tears forming in his eyes. He's right here. Chandranath turned and shone his flashlight on Baba, who was standing a few feet away in the pitch dark. My son, Baba said, today I have given you much pain. It is my mistake. Ram Naresh fell at his feet weeping, despite the soggy conditions. No, Baba, when I came out of my house, the weather was fine, but then the storm sprang up. Yes, I know. You have followed my order, but I didn't follow it. Please, Baba, don't say that. Okay, come, let us move. Throughout the walk, back to Baba's house, Ram Naresh had to struggle to fight back his tears, overcome by his love for the Master, a love so powerful it had drawn Baba to him in the rain. Ram Naresh was not the only singer of devotional songs who was able to command Baba's presence by his longing. On another occasion, Mashin Bahadur was meditating in Baba's room in the ashram when Ananda Kishore arrived with his 11-year-old daughter. Ananda Kishore asked his daughter to wait for him in the front room and then join Machine for meditation. While the two men were meditating, his daughter started singing a devotional song, dancing and crying as she sang. Soon both men found themselves crying as well. They lost consciousness of the passage of time, half listening to the song, half meditating. Suddenly they heard Bindeshwari shouting, Who is there? When the two men opened their eyes, they found Baba sitting beside them, his eyes half closed, listening in rapture to the girl's song. Bindeshwari was with him and looking very upset. Just look at Baba's feet, Bindeshwari shouted. See how red they are. The men were startled to see the condition of Baba's feet, but still, they didn't understand what was going on. You brought him here on a hot summer afternoon. What were you thinking? See, he didn't even take the time to put on his shoes. Both Machine and Ananda Kishore started to cry. They began massaging Baba's feet, while the master remained in rapture, seemingly oblivious to their presence. Slowly Baba returned to his normal consciousness, and they were able to accompany him to his house. After they had left Baba at his door, Bindeshwari told them what had happened. I was lying on a bench on my veranda, trying to get some relief from the heat, when I saw somebody in a dhoti and an undershirt walking barefoot down the road. I was startled to see someone walking barefoot in this hot sun, but it took a minute or two before I realized that it was Baba. I couldn't believe it, so I ran and brought Baba inside the house. While he was sitting down, I brought a pair of shoes and a shirt for him. When I asked him what he was doing out walking barefoot in the hot sun like that, 
He told me that his devotee was in the ashram calling him. He couldn't bear to stay away. Every devotee had a story to tell about their relationship with the Master. A relationship so deep that whenever they faced any serious problem, be it physical, mental, or spiritual, they put their faith in him to rescue them from their predicament. One of these was Jitendra Tyagi, a wealthy, hard-drinking businessman and a close friend of Astana, who had taken initiation from Baba in October 1954 after his family, concerned by his drinking, had urged him to adopt some spiritual path. Soon after his initiation, Baba sent Shiva Shankar Banerjee to Bagalpur with the message that Tiagi was suffering from an advanced case of tuberculosis in both lungs. If he wanted to live, he would have to give up drinking immediately. Tiagi was shaken by the message, but the idea of giving up alcohol was unthinkable. Plagued by a chronic cough for the last few months, he had been able to control his problem with regular doses of whiskey, the same miracle drink he liked to brag to his friends, that had enabled him to spend his winter vacation in the mountain resort of Darjeeling without having to wear anything more than a light shirt. He would consider seeing a doctor, but giving up alcohol was simply out of the question. Within a week, Tiagi was running a temperature. Soon, he became so weak that he found it difficult to get out of bed. Astana, worried that his friend was not following Baba's instructions, urged him to stop drinking and do his meditation and yoga postures as strictly as possible. How can you expect me to meditate when I find it difficult to even sit up? Tiagi told him. Are you trying to kill me with this meditation? My problem only became worse after I got initiated. But Ashtana continued to insist, and a few days later, when Tiagi began to cough up blood, he finally made good on his promise to see a doctor. He left the next day for Calcutta, where he stayed in the house of Raghubir Prasar, collector of customs, and one of his closest friends, as well as Astana's boss. There he was examined by an eminent specialist. Dr. Bidan Chandra Roy, who confirmed the contents of Baba's message. He was diagnosed with an advanced case of acute tuberculosis in both lungs and put on a long-term program of daily injections and strict bed rest. But eventually, after he failed to respond to the treatment, the doctor broke the sad news that there was not much more he could do. Pray to God, Dr. Roy advised him. At this point, he is your best hope. The next morning, while lying in his bed, Tiagi heard a voice inside him say, Once you have surrendered to me, you cannot surrender to the doctors and their medicines. As the day advanced, the voice grew stronger, and by the evening, he had made up his mind. Though he was barely able to walk, he got up from his bed. Over the worried objections of his host, he somehow made his way to the train station, where he boarded the overnight train for Bagalpur. Once he arrived in Bagalpur, he phoned Astana and requested him to take him to Jamalpur by car. I have thrown my medicines away, he said. I will put my life in Baba's hands. If he cannot save me, then I will go home to Delhi and die there. But I will not take any more medicines or see any more doctors. The two men arrived in Jamalpur in the evening and proceeded directly to the railway quarters ashram where a small group of disciples had gathered to wait for Baba. While Tiagi sat quietly in one corner, Astana told the disciples about Tiagi's condition. Collectively, they discussed how best to approach Baba. While they were conversing, they heard a knock at the door. Everyone fell quiet. Pranay rushed to the door 
to open it, and in stepped Baba, with his characteristic energy. He strode up to the cot and sat down while the disciples gathered round him. He gave a short talk and conversed directly with several disciples, but he didn't say anything to Tiagi, and no one dared bring the matter up directly. Then Baba surprised him by saying that he had some important work and needed to be left alone. Everyone spilled out into the courtyard and began discussing what to do. But a minute or two later, a shout went up. Tiagi Sahib, Tiagi Sahib, Baba is calling you. Tiagi rushed to Baba's room and prostrated in front of the master. Where are you running away to? Baba asked him. Tiagi had no idea what Baba was referring to. Not knowing what to say, he kept quiet. Are you ill? Baba asked. Yes, Baba, Tiagi replied, bowing his head. Baba closed his eyes for a few moments. Then he reached out his left foot and touched his toe to Tiagi's chest. Go eat and be merry. Tiagi did pranam and left the room. As soon as he was back in the courtyard, Astana was stunned to see him looking younger and stronger, as if he had instantly put on weight. What happened, he asked. But the only thing Tiagi could say was that he was starving. They accompanied Bindeshwari to Bindeshwari's house, where Tiagi ate a huge meal, the first good meal he had eaten in several months. It was only after he had eaten that he was able to explain what had transpired while he was alone with Baba. What did you feel exactly, they asked, after he completed his story. Did you feel an electric current pass through you when Baba touched you? No, nothing. I just felt ravenously hungry. A few days later, Tiagi returned to Calcutta and told Ragubir that his guru had cured him. Ragubir accompanied him to Dr. Roy's for a fresh examination. The doctor was pleasantly shocked to find that all traces of his tuberculosis had disappeared. Your x-ray is that of a patient who has had TV in the past and recovered. Who treated you? How were you cured? No one treated me, Tiagi replied. I just prayed to God as you advised me. The next day, Raghavir Prasad phoned Astana and insisted that he arrange for his immediate initiation. The collector of customs would soon become one of Baba's most fervent disciples. Now that he had recovered, Tiagi felt the urge to drink return. But when he went to a liquor shop to buy a bottle of whiskey, he discovered that he no longer wanted it. He never drank again. When Astana communicated Raghavir's request to Baba, the master told him that he was going to Bagalpur the following week and that Raghubir should meet him at a particular spot on the bank of the Ganges at sunset. Immediately after his initiation, Raghubir was filled with self-doubt, convinced that it would be difficult for him to atone for all his sins in one life. But Baba told him, God has given you eyes in the front of your head and not in the back. Look forward and not backward. A cursory look back might be necessary once in a while to remind oneself that one never wants to go back there again. But that is all. I have cleansed you of your past today. From now on, you are a new man. Tiagi was not the only person with TB to seek a cure from Baba. Quite understandable considering the widespread prevalence of the disease at that time. It is estimated that in 1955, there were 14 million cases of tuberculosis in India. Even today, it remains the country's number one cause of infectious disease mortality, with half a million deaths in two million reported cases, 30% of the worldwide total. Later in the same year, Dr. Bishwanath found out that his brother-in-law was suffering from an advanced case of tuberculosis. He took him to a renowned specialist, Dr. Matsu, 
who had had great success treating tuberculosis. But after examining the patient, the doctor told him that the disease was at such an advanced stage that he could do nothing for him. When the family learned that the disease was incurable, they became desperate. Having heard the miraculous stories that Bishwanath would often tell, they started pressing him to ask his guru to intercede. Bishwanath was reluctant to do so. He explained to them that Baba did not meet people who were not initiated. Moreover, the patient would almost certainly have to travel to Jamalpur, something he did not appear to be in a condition to do. The family, however, was insistent. They agreed to take initiation and to travel together with the patient. Bishwanath acceded and traveled with them to Jamalpur, where he arranged for their initiation without disclosing the purpose of their visit. Once they were initiated, he went to see Baba. Before he could get up from Sastang Pranam, Baba started scolding him. Why are you turning me into an asylum, Bishwanath? The only reason you brought your relatives here was to try and cure your brother-in-law's disease. None of them took initiation due to spiritual motivation. Bishwanath hung his head, unable to look Baba in the eyes. You know the philosophy of samskara. Your brother-in-law is suffering from this disease as a result of his previous actions. As per the law of Prakriti, he has to undergo this suffering in order to expiate the reactions of his evil deeds from the past. Do you want me to violate the laws of Prakriti? Again, Bishwanath kept silent. He folded his hands to his chest and mentally told Baba that he would accept whatever he thought best. Very well, Baba said. Do one thing. Take the patient to the well and give him a bath with forty buckets of cold water. Then bring him to see me, and don't worry. There is no question of his dying. Bishwanath was ashamed that he had bothered his guru with such a request, but he was confident that whatever Baba prescribed was sure to work. He went back to his sister's family and conveyed Baba's instructions. At first they were frightened, especially the patient, who was afraid that he might die there and then from such a bath. But Bishwanath would not take no for an answer. This is the Guru's command. You go against it at your peril. The thinly veiled warning was enough. Bishwanath gave the patient the bath, as Baba had instructed, and then took him to meet the Master. Baba gave the brother-in-law his blessing and told Bishwanath to take him for a walk to the tiger's grave by Baba's normal route and back again without stopping. Despite the fact that the patient was feeling extremely weak and had been prescribed total bed rest by his doctors, he was willing to follow Baba's instructions. By the time they completed the nearly two-hour circuit, he was feeling better than he had in months. The family was astonished to see the change. The patient was so happy that instead of returning home with the rest of the family, he stayed on for another month in Jamalpur to have Baba's daily darshan. Not long afterward, Bishwanath came down with severe throat pain, so severe that he had difficulty drinking water. He saw a doctor, but the treatment didn't help. Still, he declined to tell Baba about it, preferring to undergo the samskara and let the disease run its course. Baba's lesson now firmly implanted in his mind. After three days, a person whom he had never seen before knocked at his door and handed him a package. Baba sent me to deliver this to you. He said it is a medicine for your throat. Bishwana folded his palms to his chest, sending a silent pranam to Baba. He took a dose, and within a few hours, the pain subsided. The next day, his throat now completely healed. He went to Baba and asked him for the formula. Inspired by the thought that he could help a lot of people if he knew how to prepare the remedy. Baba smiled and said, Ah, Bishwanath, do you want to earn money with this remedy? Baba declined to tell him the formula. 
As time went on, Baba would get more and more strict with his disciples about not projecting him as a miracle worker, especially when it came to curing people of their diseases. Virendra Astana remembered Baba's attitude at the time in one of his interviews. In 1956 or 1957, the wife of one of the senior officers of the Indian Civil Service, Saroj Lal, came down with cancer. I think it was 1957. I got a trunk call from the chief minister's office informing me of her situation. I had no courage to ask anything more about her because she was not even initiated. They requested me to at least ask Baba. I told them that since she was passing through the last stages of the cancer, there was no question of even asking. It was too late for that. Still, when I went to Jamalpur, I told Baba that such a call had come to me from the phone of the chief minister. Baba asked me what I had told him in reply. I told him that I had said it was too late, that if they had asked earlier, then she could have learned sadhana, and then there would have been a chance of a cure. Baba told me, Look, I don't want to be projected as a doctor. I don't want to be projected as a Christ. This practice people have of talking about these things should be stopped. Baba didn't come to this earth to show miracles. These are not my miracles. It is due to people's surrender that such things happen. Why should I be advertised as a doctor or a miracle worker? That was his attitude in 1957, I said. How can I prevent it, Baba said. Why not? You are in contact with many people. People are moving here and there and talking about these things. I don't want any of my disciples talking about these things to other people. Anyhow, there was a customs officer, Om Prakash Seti, who worked in the customs office in Allahabad. He was from Lucknow. He took initiation as almost everyone in the customs department had done. There were about a thousand or two thousand people who had taken initiation in that department. Before initiation, he used to smoke a lot, but after initiation, he gave up the habit. Then one day, another person in the Allahabad customs office, who had also taken initiation, came to me and said, Sir, my friend Seti is in trouble. I asked him what the trouble was. He told me that Seti had gone to look now for a health examination, and the doctors there had told him that he had lung cancer. If it had been tuberculosis, then it might have been curable. But since it was cancer, it was not curable at that time. He came back to Allahabad, and his wife was weeping. She came to our house crying and pleaded with me to do something. I listened, but kept quiet. I didn't say anything or promise anything. Then she went to my wife and insisted that Baba could do something. At that time, her husband was 32, and she was about 29. My wife came to me and told me that they were so young. I must talk to Baba about the matter. But I was reluctant to do so knowing how Baba felt about these things. Then we went to Jamalpur and went on field walk. My wife went with us to the tiger's grave. She told Baba about Om Prakash Seti's cancer and what the doctors had said. Baba said, What can I do? It is due to his samskara. She told Baba that he should do something because his wife was so young and they had a new baby. She kept insisting that Baba should cure him. Finally, Baba said, All right, you ask Virendra what should be done. Don't worry, everything will be all right. Now, I did not know anything about yogic shikitsa at that time. Baba's book had not come out yet. I just told him to do sadhana properly. Within one fortnight, his cancer disappeared. Probably Baba wanted him to rectify his sadhana. Later he became an acharya, and his elder brother's daughter 
became an avadutika, a female monastic disciple. Thank you.